Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first off, on behalf of Congressman Juan Vargas, I'd like to thank the Every Life Foundation and RDLA and the Rare Disease Advocacy Community for having us here today. My name is Scott Hinkle. I'm Congressman Vargas's legislative director. He represents uh, Southern San Diego, California's 51st district, the entire California-Mexico border. And unlike my uh, fellow members, we do have a little bit of the beach. <laughs> so I'm here today to talk to you about H.R. 3731, the Rare Disease Fund Act, or RAD Fund Act, as we like to call it. And before I really dive into the specifics of the bill, I'd like to talk to you about something that seems like it might be an unrelated topic, but is incredibly relevant. And that would be how movies are financed. So can I see a quick show of hands? Who here has seen the most recent Star Wars film? Okay, who's seen it more than once? Still decent. All right, now how many of you have seen Tomorrowland in the theaters? It's uh, less than the number that saw the, the Star Wars movie twice. So if you're a movie studio executive, you want Star Wars A Force Awakens, multi-billion dollar film. You don't want Tomorrowland, which was one of the top 20 biggest flops of all time, lost the studio about $100 million. So the movie pic motion picture industry had this question, this problem for a long time, which was basically how do we fund this when we don't know if it's going to be a giantly successful film like Star Wars Force Awakens or a huge flop like Tomorrowland. And so they thought, you know, maybe we're pretty good at predicting this. Well, if you look at the top 10 most anticipated movies of 2015, some of them are things you might expect. But if you look at the movies that are highest grossing in 2015, well, they're not really the same thing. Now, there's some movies that are still on there, but some of them have kind of fallen off. And so obviously, you want to figure out how do you handle this? Because if you're betting on something that's going to be successful or you think is going to be successful, like, for instance, Tomorrowland probably looked great on paper. Disney had previously funded a theme park inspired movie before, Pirates of the Caribbean, $3.7 billion franchise. And it had Johnny Depp, and then Tomorrowland here is George Clooney. It's also based on a Disney ride, had a good director, and they're figuring this is going to make a lot of money. Well, obviously, it didn't work out so well for them. So the movie industry can't, couldn't continue basically funding these as one offs. So what did they do instead? Well, they switched to a thing called slave financing where instead of funding a single picture at one time, they go over to investments, investors, banks, pension funds, life insurers, mutual funds. Instead, they'd ask them to fund an entire slate of pictures. Basically, this is Warner Brothers slate from 2015. And if you take a quick look at it, you may notice that the top three films were all successful. San Andreas made half a billion dollars, Mad Max, 350 million, and then Gallows made $40 million on a budget of 100,000 third highest return on investment film of all time. It's pretty good. Um, on the other hand, Pan and Jupiter Ascending each lost their studio somewhere between 65 and $100 million. Well, that ended up working out okay because the revenues of the first one still let them pay back their investors. So you may be asking, okay, what does this have to do with the life science industry? Well, currently, we kind of do the same thing. We fund projects one off. And so as a result, if you have a drug that makes it all the way through the FDA process, it's worth billions of dollars. But if it fails somewhere along the way, it's worth practically nothing. And as a result, venture capitalists are a little bit wary of doing that. And so you have what's now called the valley of death. It's basically a steadily widening funding gap between the beginning, or excuse me, the end of preclinical trials and the end of phase two of FDA trials. And the venture capital industry, I mean, it's willing to do much, but you, I'm sure you've heard more and more that they're less willing to fund early stage development. Just out of curiosity, anybody know what the venture capital industry makes up in the U.S. investment market? No, I wouldn't have said that. They only make up about 175 to 200 billion dollars. But what the movie industry got right when they did slate financing is they tapped into the U.S. debt market, the U.S. bond market. That's 38 trillion dollars with a T. So obviously orders of magnitude more money. So if we want to solve the early stage financing issues in drug development, why don't we just do what the movie industry does? Why don't we go to our investors and say, hey, why don't you invest in a diversified portfolio of drugs? Instead of investing in a single drug at a time, why don't you get intellectual property of each of these various compounds, and as a result, put your money into that instead. And because it'll diversify, it reduces the risk, just like you would with your pension, your 401k, et cetera. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. And it lowers the risk and allows us to tap into that debt market, where if we just get even a fraction of that, we would massively increase the amount of money that goes into early stage development. And so 
if even most of the compounds in that thing, there's 10 listed there, let's say only one makes it through, still enough money and drug royalty revenue to pay back all of the investors. So really at the end of the day, this is exactly what the RAD fund does. It creates a $400 million pilot project. It basically, it's going to be privately owned and operated, so it's going to, not going to be managed by the federal government, be private investors making profitability decisions and determining all that, but it only finances early stage development. We're only trying to address the value of death. So basically, end of preclinical research to the end of stage two, you actually have to sell the drugs off at that point. And the government guarantees the bonds. So the government's role in this is we're just offering insurance that the government will pay back the bonds in the event that they default. And lastly, it leverages a scientific expertise at NIH. Now, this idea came to us from some folks at MIT who did a study of this, and they've determined that with a $400 million fund, it would be successful. It only takes 10 to 20 compounds. That's it. So basically, we're asking for a pilot project. All it, it sunsets after it basically tests run. We don't want to replace the private market. We just want to prove that it works so that institutional investors will go ahead and make their own mega funds. And with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Andrew Lowe, Dr. Roger Stein, and Jose Maria Fernandez at MIT for doing the pioneering research that led to the RAD Fund. And I'm happy to take any questions. Nice